Everything we've known about the Bible for the past millennia is wrong. It turns out that the Bible has been completely misinterpreted from Hebrew, and a whole new story opens up when you consider the literal translation. That is nothing like the qualities of God revealed by Jesus and those who wrote for him in the New Testament. This is just the start of a few revelations made by a Vatican Bible translator that changes absolutely everything. So join us as we explore the findings of two scholars, Paul Wallace and Mauro Biglino, who have found something that carries profound significance for our comprehension of human existence and our cosmic role. The Scholars One of these two scholars is Paul Wallace. Paul Wallace is an author celebrated internationally for his bestsellers. He is also a host of Fifth Kind TV, offers life coaching, and is an avid researcher. His literary works delve into world mythologies and ancestral tales, seeking to unravel the mysteries of human beginnings, our latent potential, and our cosmic connection. As a prominent figure in the church, Wallace contributed as a church doctor, theological educator, and archdeacon within the Anglican Church in Australia and is recognized for his extensive publications on Christian mysticism and spirituality. His eloquence as a speaker has garnered him acclaim at global summits and conferences. George Nori praised his revolutionary 2020 publication, Escaping from Eden, comparing it to Eric von Daniken's influential Chariots of the Gods. This sent Wallace to global recognition as a prominent authority in the study of ancient alien contact. The success continued with his 2021 follow-up, The Scars of Eden, which also enjoyed international bestseller status and further endorsements from Von Daniken. Wallace's interviews and documentaries have captivated audiences worldwide, numbering in the millions. The other scholar is Vatican Bible translator Mauro Biglino. He is an Italian scholar who has dedicated many years to translating, publishing, and presenting at conferences. His journey began with the translation of Masoretic Hebrew manuscripts for the Catholic publisher Edizioni San Paolo, a task of considerable complexity. Biglino's expertise lies in his analysis of the original Hebrew texts, exploring the nuances of their linguistic meanings as opposed to the numerous subsequent interpretations of the Bible and church history. His work encompasses a range of topics including conspiracy theories, ufology, and theories regarding ancient astronauts. Mauro Biglino is an individual of undeniable influence in contemporary discourse both within Italy and on the international stage. He has openly acknowledged that his conceptual framework draws heavily from the pioneering works of Eric von Daniken and Zecharia Sitchin, two figures known for their unconventional theories. Biglino's intellectual journey is marked by a long-standing dedication to the scholarly examination of religious texts, a pursuit he has engaged in for approximately 30 years underpinned by a foundation in classical studies. His scholarly endeavors commenced with his work on the San Paolo translations, which brought to light 17 books of the Old Testament based on the Leningrad Codex. This work set the stage for his subsequent publications and lectures across Italy, showcasing the findings of his research. So what is Mauro's contribution to Hebrew translation? Well, his most significant and controversial suggestion is that the prevailing interpretations of the Bible are flawed, saying that historical mistranslations have obscured the true messages of the ancient texts. Biglino showcases his evidence and insights in many ways, including books, videos, and conferences, reaching audiences worldwide. His meticulous analysis of Hebrew scriptures has yielded translations that challenge traditional interpretations, advocating for a literal rather than symbolic understanding of the Bible. This will make more sense as we go further into his work. Biglino's approach to biblical analysis is characterized by a hypothetical framework, often employing the phrase, let's pretend that, as a starting point for his explorations. 
which operate under the premise that the Bible we know today differs significantly from its original form. His work does not delve into the realms of religion or spirituality. Rather, it focuses on a literal translation of sacred texts, leading to a provocative claim that has stirred considerable attention. That the Bible doesn't talk about God. According to Biglino, the Bible narrates the interactions between the family of Jacob, also known as Israel, and a being named Yahweh, who is part of a group called the Elohim. Yahweh, under the directive of the group's leader, Elion, is tasked with governing the people of Israel. Biglino presents this interpretation in a straightforward, unambiguous manner, distinguishing his work as unique and unequivocal. What's most interesting is the meaning of the word Elohim, according to Mauro Biglino. However, before we dive into Mauro's understanding of the word, let's take a step back and see what's generally accepted by the public. What is Elohim? Within the Christian tradition, each name ascribed to God is reflective of a distinct facet of His divine nature. Despite the existence of only one deity, the authors of the Bible employed a variety of names to describe this singular entity. Among these, Elohim stands out as a term frequently invoked in the sacred texts. It is present in the opening verse of Genesis, where in the beginning Elohim created the heavens and the earth. This word Elohim shows up approximately 2,750 times throughout the Old Testament. The designation Elohim conveys the notion of one who is the supreme one or mighty one. Its application extends beyond the singular deity to encompass human leaders, judicial figures, and even celestial beings. The usage of Elohim does not exclusively refer to the unique God, but serves to denote any being demonstrating sovereign authority or formidable strength. That said, Mauro Biglino has shown us a different meaning of Elohim. Or more accurately, he provides us with the literal meaning of Elohim. According to him, Elohim is not singular, it is plural. Let's take a deeper look into what he means. The truth behind Elohim. As a reminder, Mauro Biglino is a distinguished and often debated figure who has devoted decades to the meticulous translation of ancient biblical Hebrew for Edizioni San Paolo, a preeminent European publishing house specializing in religious literature. Despite lacking formal academic qualifications, Biglino's passion and deep interest in ancient texts have established him as one of Italy's most esteemed Bible translators. His approachable and enthusiastic scholarship has lit the path for many seeking to comprehend the Bible's original messages. He is not to be mistaken for a conspiracy theorist, as his credentials speak volumes for his knowledge and expertise in this field. So what does he say about the Bible? Biglino offers a unique perspective on the Bible's true meaning. He says that there are inherent uncertainties we face when interpreting the text. Our limited understanding of the ancient scriptures means that we should look for a deeper exploration of the subject according to him. Furthermore, Professor Garbini, a Semitic philology expert at La Sapienza University in Rome, suggests that Hebrew is a South Phoenician Canaanite dialect, one of several within the Canaanite language family. Our knowledge of Hebrew is based on its reconstruction at the end of the first millennium A.D., known as Majority Hebrew. During that era, the focus was not on the linguistic structure, but rather on the theological implications shaped by the diverse strands of Judaism. So as a result, Biglino says that when we read the Bible, we are not engaging with a text governed by grammatical rules, but one that has been molded by ideological influences, where grammatical precision was not a concern for the original authors. This is particularly relevant when considering the evolution of grammatical rules over time, such as those pertaining to the term Elohim. While inherently plural, it has been singularized within the biblical context for reasons that remain debated. Biglino, however, insists that Elohim should be understood as a plural term and not translated as God, 
Edizioni San Paolo's publication of 17 Old Testament books, translated directly from the Masoretic text by Mauro Biglino, was initially uneventful. These translations were incorporated into their Hebrew interlinear Bible edition. However, the situation shifted when Biglino began to publish his interpretations of the ancient texts. Biglino has elaborated on his relationship with Edizioni San Paolo through videos. Essentially, Biglino's readings of the Bible diverge significantly from the theological constructs developed over two millennia. Biglino asserts with certainty that the contemporary Bible does not reflect the original text. He provocatively claims that the Bible does not discuss God, but rather narrates the history of a single Semitic tribe, the descendants of Jacob, and their interactions with Yahweh, whom they regard as their leader. This raises the question, is Yahweh not considered God? According to Biglino, the concept of God familiar to us today is the result of 2,000 years of theological interpretation, heavily influenced by Greek Hellenistic philosophy. This extensive theological analysis has led to the portrayal of God as immortal, transcendent, all-knowing, and all-powerful. Yet Biglino points out that the biblical narratives depict a different character in Java, one who exhibits fatigue, dirtiness, anger, thirst, jealousy, ferocity, and even cruelty. Most notably, Jave is not depicted as a solitary figure. Biglino emphasizes that Jave is merely one member of a collective known as the Elohim, challenging traditional monotheistic views. The Hebrew word Elohim, traditionally translated as God in biblical translations, is inherently plural, yet it is used to denote the singular concept of God. This discrepancy has been perceived as a sign of the monotheistic reinterpretation of the ancient biblical texts over thousands of years. The Italian biblical scholar suggests that due to the ambiguity surrounding the exact meaning of Elohim, it might be a good idea to refrain from translating it, leaving it in its original form. This recommendation gains traction when considering that Elohim is not consistently translated as God throughout the Bible. It also assumes the meanings of kings in the context of Genesis 6 and judges in Psalm 82. These sorts of revelations have led to Mauro Biglino gaining significant attention online, with his extensive lectures captivating thousands. Despite criticism from some academic circles, who dismiss Biglino's interpretations as mere science fiction, the questions he raises continue to provoke thought. The translation of Elohim as a singular god, the mixing of Western concepts of God with ancient Semitic narratives, and the extraordinary lifespans of some biblical figures compared to others. For example, Adam, Seth, and Enosh lived up to 900 years, while Abraham and Moses lived less than 200 years. It's these types of questions that invite further inquiry and discussion. Labeling Mauro Biglino as a charlatan may seem justifiable to those who have dedicated their lives to studying the Bible, under the premise that it speaks of a spiritual omniscient entity. However, it is also understandable how one can dismiss his critiques. To accept them would be to acknowledge discrepancies in the monotheistic framework that has been meticulously constructed over two millennia. Imagine if scholars pause to reconsider the long-held assumption that Elohim refers singularly to God because of compelling grammatical and narrative evidence. Said evidence suggests that it actually denotes a collective of distinct individuals, each with their own roles, traits, and intentions. The biblical text itself introduces various other Elohim, alongside Javeh. At the end of the day, Big Lino's contributions lie in raising important questions that challenge traditional interpretations. This has led to some orthodox scholars adopting a more defensive stance against these questions that go against established theological doctrines. This might appear to some as suspicious or even close-minded. However, it's understandable when considering the gravity of these suggestions. 
Interestingly enough, figures like the esteemed Princeton Theological Seminary professor Mark Smith are beginning to recognize that polytheism was prevalent in the early history of Israel. Smith suggests that monotheism only surfaced midway through Israel's history, emerging as a counterpoint to a deep-seated tradition of polytheism. He suggests that the Deuteronomists may have retroactively edited Israel's polytheistic past to present a monotheistic narrative, a concept explored in his work, The Early History of God. There's a lot of debate, however. Theology itself is unique among academic disciplines, with its central subject, God, rooted in faith rather than empirical evidence. This field of study will never be quiet and will always provide a myriad of questions posed about a text written over 2,500 years ago, written by humans, the Bible, whether divinely inspired or not, bears the hallmarks of its creator's imperfections and cultural influences, including those from ancient civilizations like the Sumerians and Akkadians. This is a point that even Paul Wallace, the bestseller author and speaker, has mentioned. So let's take a look at his exploration of the word Elohim and its plural form that has led him to a transformative realization. Paul Wallace. Wallace's research, particularly within his Aden series, started a departure from his previous adherence to a narrow interpretation of Christian orthodoxy. He came to view the Bible not as a singular narrative about God, but rather as a series of stories depicting many different entities, stretching from the earliest passages to the final verses, which also includes the debate surrounding the word Elohim, Elohim, one of the oldest words in the Bible translated as God, is, as Mauro Biglino said, a masculine plural noun typically associated with plural verbs. Wallace's deep dive into this linguistic aspect revealed that the plurality of Elohim is not merely a grammatical glitch, as he put it. It shows us an ancient version of the narrative where Elohim was understood to embody a collective of distinct beings. In the Hebrew canon, there exists a concept known as the Sky Council, a gathering of multiple entities referred to as Elohim. Paul Wallace, in his Eden series, Escaping from Eden, The Scars of Eden and Echoes of Eden, suggests that the narratives involving the Elohim are more coherent when the term is left untranslated or interpreted as the powerful ones. So, in that sense, he agrees with Biglino, even providing the same suggestion to just leave the word untranslated. This approach not only provides clarity to the stories, but also addresses the moral problems arising from the violent and seemingly unjust actions attributed to the Elohim. The translation of Elohim as a singular God fails to account for the slaughter of humans caught in the conflicts among the Elohim. Wallace suggests that by reading the stories with Elohim as the powerful ones, we come to recognize that these accounts are abridged versions of older tales from ancient Mesopotamian civilizations such as Sumeria, Babylonia, Arcadia, and Assyria. However, Wallace's interpretation often encounters resistance from those rooted in traditional faith, particularly when it challenges the Christian theological concept of the Holy Trinity. Critics say the plural form of Elohim matches how the Trinity sees God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in that sense, there is no misinterpretation or problem to be had. However, Wallace says that they forget that the Holy Trinity is a Christian doctrine that came along a thousand years after the Bible was written, so it might not be the original intent of the authors. Furthermore, the most recent editors of the Hebrew canon adhered to a monotheistic theology, rejecting the belief in multiple deities. This monotheistic perspective is obvious in the substitution of the sacred name Yahweh for earlier references to Elohim in texts like Genesis 3 and Genesis 11. Such editorial changes have introduced moral dilemmas, raising questions about the actions attributed to a holy and loving God, particularly those involving acts of destruction or regression of civilizations, as depicted in Genesis 11. 
Wallace questions why a holy God would genocide people, or why a loving God would send people back to the Stone Age. Does this happen whenever the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit get into a fight? Of course not, as according to him, it does not refer to the Holy Trinity in the first place. If it did, then there are various acts that remain very questionable and contradictory. These revisions have led to debates over whether the biblical term Elohim represents the Holy Trinity, which is unlikely given the context and implications of the narratives. The original tales likely tell of different events, with Elohim signifying the powerful ones, a term that some theologians argue could refer to beings more advanced than humans without specifying their exact nature. This interpretation suggests that we should not jump to definitive conclusions based solely on the term Elohim. TNT Clark's publication, The Theology of the Old Testament, edited by SDF Salman, includes a quote from theologian A.B. Davidson, who suggests that angels are part of the class of Elohim. According to Wallace, this just illustrates the varied translations of Elohim within the Hebrew canon, where it can mean God, chieftains, judges, landlords, or angels, depending on the context. And if it is truly such a flexible word, why would it be chosen to refer to the singular God? The term Elohim indeed presents a fascinating linguistic elasticity within the biblical texts, serving as a designation for the singular transcendent God, while simultaneously referring to a variety of other entities. This multiplicity of meanings has led scholars to wonder why such a versatile word was chosen to represent the divine. In other words, the question shouldn't be, does Elohim really mean more than just God, and instead should be, why was this specific word chosen to represent God in the first place? According to A.B. Davidson, Elohim, meaning powers, is applied from the human perspective to all entities perceived as superior to mankind, encompassing the divine and the celestial. He also says that despite this shared nomenclature, Scripture maintains a clear distinction between God and other beings such as angels, never conflating the two. However, Wallace argues that this explanation does not fully address the diverse applications of Elohim across different contexts, where it can imply angels, false gods, demons, judges, or God. It's because of this ambiguity that Wallace suggests rereading the Bible with the term Elohim left in, so that the narratives can become even clearer to today's reader. Another theologian, Michael Heiser, is among those who recognize the term's broad scope, suggesting that Elohim encompasses a spectrum of powerful entities. Yet this interpretation only partially explains why Elohim was the initial name for God and why it would be associated with other, possibly archonic, beings. The debate extends to the dynamics among the Elohim themselves, particularly the instances where Yahweh identifies as one among them. This raises questions about the nature of the competition or interaction between Yahweh and other Elohim. Elohim competing against one another. For example, in the biblical narrative, there's an instance where Yahweh's king seeks a health diagnosis, and rather than consulting the local deity, he turns to the Elohim of Ekron. Yahweh's reaction is one of fury, questioning why the king would consult a deity in Ekron when Yahweh is present right there. At this point, it becomes obvious to the reader that there is a rivalry among the Elohim for dominance. This theme of competition is shown in the Ten Commandments, which command a collective amnesia, or forgetting, regarding other Elohim. Followers are instructed not to worship or even depict them, dedicating service solely to Yahweh. Joshua, Moses' successor, reinforces this point, urging the people to renounce the Elohim worshipped in Egypt and Mesopotamia in favor of exclusive allegiance to Yahweh. This paints a picture of a pantheon where Yahweh is but one among many powerful entities within the Hebrew tales. 
The narrative also speaks of a celestial assembly, the Sky Council, where multiple Elohim convene under Yahweh's leadership. The notion of a council with fictitious members presided over by a real entity, Yahweh, is hard to comprehend, according to Wallace. It suggests that the stories we have today, shaped by edits from the 7th to 6th century BCE, may have evolved from an earlier tradition that acknowledged a multitude of Elohim, each overseeing their own human communities. Mauro Biglino and Paul Wallace are among those who have highlighted the ethical problems that arise when the stories of the Elohim are interpreted as narratives about a singular God. However, they are not the first ones to do so. In the formative years of Christianity, certain influential church fathers found a discrepancy in the way Hebrew scriptures were being interpreted and sought to shift the church's stance, suggesting that these texts should not be the bedrock of Christian doctrine. This perspective was somewhat acknowledged during the Council of Jerusalem, as recorded in Acts 15, yet the debate persisted throughout the initial centuries of the Christian era. These early theologians argued that interpreting the Elohim narratives as stories about a singular God would require justifying actions that would be deemed barbaric and unjust if attributed to any man. They showed us a moral conundrum in translating the Elohim accounts as tales of God. Paul Wallace agrees with Mauro Biglino's view that the final compilation of the Hebrew canon, occurring between the 7th and 6th centuries BCE, was driven by ideology rather than linguistic precision. In other words, they weren't worried about grammar issues, they were more concerned with pushing the ideology. This resulted in texts where polytheistic elements, like having too many gods, were sanitized, yet according to Wallace, the grammar was a complete mess. In stories where Yahweh's name is pasted on top, the original grammatical structure remains in the passages. According to Wallace, this suggests that the initial versions of these stories acknowledge the existence of multiple deities or superior beings, a concept obscured in later translations. So, in essence, you might not be reading the original version of these stories. The only way to properly understand and comprehend these narratives is when one recognizes the existence of multiple powerful ones, each vying for influence and control. This henotheistic landscape, where henotheistic means one god being revered above others, persists subtly within the texts. For example, Abraham's journey from Ur of the Chaldees is described in a way that emphasizes the collective directive he received. He states that the powerful ones told him to move, and the original Hebrew text uses a plural form verb to convey this command. This plurality is maintained in the Hebrew language, but becomes obscured in the English translation, where the verb told does not distinguish between singular or plural subjects. This grammatical nuance is crucial because it reveals that Abraham was referring to multiple entities, not a singular deity. The work of translators like Mauro Biglino, who provided precise translations of the interlinear Bible without theological bias, is essential to understanding these subtleties. The plural verbs in Hebrew, which have been altered to singular in English translations to fit monotheistic narratives, suggest a different interpretation than what is commonly presented. Next, Paul Wallace, in his Eden series, further explores this concept, particularly when the Elohim say, let us make the humans to look like one of us. This phrase, which clearly indicates plurality, poses both philosophical and grammatical challenges if Elohim is translated as God. However, when Elohim is understood as the powerful ones, these issues are resolved, aligning the narrative with the idea of multiple powerful beings rather than a single omnipotent deity. On top of that, in Genesis 3, the narrative presents a debate among the Elohim regarding the level of intelligence to be granted to humans. One voice among them expresses the desire to limit human intelligence to a level below their own, saying that humans shouldn't be as intelligent as one of us. 
This plurality and conflict within the language are apparent even to casual readers and are resolved when one acknowledges the presence of multiple Elohim in the story. Willis even says that this is not a new story, but rather a condensed version of the ancient Mesopotamian conflict between the deities Enlil and Enki. In his book, Escaping from Eden, the argument is made for interpreting Elohim as the powerful ones, which aligns the biblical stories with their ancient sources and brings forth a coherent picture. However, even if one chooses not to adopt this interpretation, simply retaining the term Elohim in the text allows for a different understanding of the story to surface. According to Willis, this alternative reading offers new insights into the world of our ancestors, our origins, and our place in the cosmos. What do you think of these revelations, though? Let us know in the comments below and be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more.